think investors and operators should be thinking about their long-term strategy in order to mitigate risk and retain profitability? I think, you know, there's a lot of common sense in the, in the world, right? And what you do see is that, you know, especially in, with, with investors, you know, they sort of follow, you know, where other investors go. And before you know it, you enter some sort of pyramid scheme. And as we all know, if you are part of that scheme and you walk away in time, it's not a big problem because the issues are passed on to the next generation of investors. Uh, but eventually, you know, some of these companies go either bust or, uh, you know, they will just, you know, you see the value of the companies uh, uh, decrease. So uh, someone will pick up, uh, pick up that bill. Uh, and we know all these things, you know, they, they, these, these schemes have, we have seen through the ages, you know, that in the past people paid, you know, uh, the price of a, of, a, of a big house for a tulip bulb in, in Holland in the, in the 17th century, right? Uh, and if anyone could have thought it's not that, you know, it doesn't have that particular value. Uh, but people still, and especially, you know, lazy investors to a certain extent are attracted to these sort of schemes to a certain extent. So I, I think that is, uh, there will always, uh, always be risky. Uh, but logic is an interesting, and, and common sense is an interesting concept because as early as in February or March, you, know, you could already see changes that were here to stay, fundamental changes and shifts in the market. Uh, nonetheless, leaders didn't do anything. You know, there was an inertia with business leaders because of the government providing them with an awful lot of free money. Uh, and if you look today, you know, the balance sheets actually look very, very good and very strong. Some retailers are now passing on their money back to the government, like Tesco, I think it was like 500 million. Uh, I read the other day and some others follow suit. Uh, so the balance sheets are very, very strong, uh, but they haven't really taken fundamental strategic decisions to make changes. And what you hear all the time is, yeah, you know, there is no urgency or we don't know all the answers yet or we don't know all the problems. But actually, you know, we do know that after 66 days, consumer behavior changes are there to stay. You know, it's research is in the, uh, in the literature. Everybody should be able to know these sort of things. What we also know is regardless of what is happening now, people have learned that certain elements in life are more important, for instance, than consumption. Uh, consumption as leisure activity is not as important anymore. People have learned the value of being, you know, with, with, with locals, being with your family, uh, you know, having a good time, instead of just maybe buying your fifth pair of jeans that you don't know because you already have four, right? So there are these sort of fundamental shifts that you can already start predicting, but you need to act and nobody acts. If you look at places where somehow people come together, whether there's a cruise ship or it's a, a restaurant, you know, this whole, or, or, or you're in event marketing, or these sort of businesses will continue to suffer because it's not like you switch off COVID tomorrow and once all of a sudden everybody's going out. People have, are afraid, people are care, you know, they're careful, they've changed their behavior, they go to eat, they've learned to cook at home, so they don't, to, don't go to a restaurant. We know all these things. We know 80% of what is there to know, but we did, nobody still acts. Um, the, the way I look at it, if you look at the businesses now, there are only three types of businesses, right? There are businesses that have a product or a service that is no longer required or in less quantity. There are businesses with products and services that everybody seems, you know, seems to want. So they're growing now with tremendous growth. And you have businesses sort of in between that need to make sure that they make the right transformation to become, you know, growth companies rather than companies that need to be restructured. So if you look at how people tend to talk about individuals, how they would come out of lockdown, a hunk, a chunk or a drunk, you could actually apply that to businesses as well. Right. So you have the chunks. These companies, these businesses are simply now too fat. They have to go into restructuring mode. They need to get rid of a lot of costs in order to survive because people don't want really what they have to offer anymore. Then, of course, you have the hunks. You have the guys that do home delivery. They do local stuff that everyone knows now. And they go to tremendous growth, two times, three times, four times, five times the growth. 
brings their own challenges because working capital issues, uh, employees issue, but you know, it's of course positive, but also they have to go to all sort of, you know, challenges if you like. And in the middle, you have the drunks. They're sort of walking around and don't really know what to do yet. Uh, and if they make the wrong decisions, you know, they fall over and they become a chunk unless they make the right decisions and they you know, got, take it forward and then become a, a hunk, if you like. And there are no other businesses. All the businesses you can think of will fall in one of those three buckets. And what is really remarkable to me is that there is so little change yet. Prior to COVID, all the management teams and the strategies were aligned. That's normal because the leadership teams were actually executing that particular strategy. Now we know that all the strategies will have to change or at least have to adjust it. So you would argue that means that also those leadership chain teams need to be changed or adjusted or something at least needs to happen. Well, I pick up the Financial Times every day and I'm looking at the front page and trying to find these bold chairman that actually took action and have you know, changed their team, have changed the strategy. I don't see it. I really don't see it. So to my opinion, there's not enough activity. There's an inertia and that is fed by all sort of government subsidies you know, to, to people, to businesses that don't do, you know, really add any value at the moment. Why would you change your board of directors when it wasn't a result of them? It was a result of something that was economical out of their hands. Because you shouldn't look at the past. You should look at the future right? And the teams need to be fit for future. So it's not about punishing them because it's not their fault. It's not completely irrelevant whose fault it is. It is about what is the future going to look like and do I have the proper people there to, to bring me there? And, that's a, you know, and it has nothing to do whether it's uh, fair or whether it's punishment. It, the whole thing of looking back in the back mirror should be something of the past anyhow. There was more change, right? And, and everyone was re talking about it, you know, that the speed of change was accelerating it. Well, I think it has just accelerated, you know, exponentially through this whole COVID crisis. So what we tend to do is our teams are orchestras, right? So these are classical orchestras. You give them a piece of sheet music. You say, okay, I need 10 violin players, I need two trumpet players, and so on and so forth. And we're going to play this piece of music which is actually, this is our plan for the year, or this is our three-year strategy, and so on and so forth. So we, we're going to execute it. The point is, that's no longer valid, because these plans change now all the time and need to be adjusted and adapted. So rather than a classical orchestra, we need a jazz band. And we need a jazz band that is just improvising and playing what the, what the public wants. And that could be something different every, every moment, every day, every month, and so on and so forth. So this whole talk that you sometimes see now in the papers as well. Oh, it's not too bad. We only do 10% worse than last year. It's completely irrelevant because last year will never come back, right? So this is the new base. This is the new reset. And we have to see how can we get into the future. And then you get the fans. We couldn't predict a pandemic. We couldn't predict a lockdown. Well, actually, you could. We could not exactly predict COVID-19 and what exactly the implications were, but the fact that there can be a pandemic with a result, a lockdown, there are dozens, if not more, books and films on this particular topic. Would I have had a real diversified board and not diversified just gender or whatever, passport, but diversified in terms of thought, if I would have an author or a filmmaker on the board, he could have helped, he or she could have helped us with different scenarios, right? And you don't see it happening. The thing is, I've, 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 I've sort of said it to once or twice before, and the people say, yeah, but you don't know exactly COVID. It's irrelevant. You could take a lockdown. A lockdown could be because of the weather, could be because of, you know, a virus, could be a terrorist attack. It doesn't really matter. But there are scenarios that actually lead to a lockdown. And if there is a lockdown, what are we going to do as a business? It's completely irrelevant to know exactly why the lockdown is there, right? It's only a consequence of something else. And I agree, that's something else you can't predict. But it, it's, it's not relevant, is it?
please don't forget to like, share and subscribe um, for conversations just like this.